Welcome, welcome, welcome to all the participants. Thank you very much for being here in our last high-level dialogue in which we are discussing how to build a green and health recover after the pandemic. I am Manuel Pulgar Vidal, Climate and Energy Global Practice Leader with WWF International, and I will take five minutes of your time because it is our last dialogue. So this is to say thank you to you all, to you who participate in the last one and in this one, because I think that we have discussed strong things. We have made good conclusions that for sure are going to be sent to decision makers because we are expecting a green and healthy recovery. But also I am here to thank you, our partners. WWF has made this possible with the OECD, with EDF, and in this time with a collaboration of Conservation International and the National Conservancy. It has been a great effort. It has been an effort of collaboration, what it is what we do need in this time, cooperation and collaboration, because we are exactly in the same boat. We are going to the same. We are looking for a green and healthy recovery. And also I am here to frame in four minutes what it should be the discussion for today. And after that, I am going to introduce our moderator. We do need to recognize that this pandemic has already created a strong economic consequence. We are living really in an economic crisis. So that is why we should discuss how are we planning to recover our countries, our economies, and people well, and how can we make a build back better, that it is the main principle for this recovery. We know how much is going to be the decrease of the GDP. For Latin America, for example, the IMF has estimated the decrease of GDP in between minus five to minus 13.5. And for poorest or developing countries, that is really, really a main, a big, big crisis. Also, we are going to lose employment. And that is probably the sad part of this equation and of these difficulties. So probably we are going to have economies that are going to bring more informality that on the other hand, it has already damaged our economy. So how can we address that loss of employment? Also, what we could have it is a temptation for a backsliding of our environmental regulation or the relaxation of those regulations. So that is something that we must face, how to avoid that temptation. And on the other hand, we haven't been able, at least yet, to develop a strong narrative that connects the economy with nature, with climate. Probably with climate, we are in a better position, but not too much with nature. So we should work in developing that narrative by creating permanent place, well-balanced with decision makers, with institutions, with people who is working on that. I think that in some way, what you, we should Take it is the experience that climate has developed with the new climate economy commission or the climate and the economy commission to develop something similar to create some strong place in which we could discuss the relation in between nature and the economy. And on the other hand, this pandemic has told us that it has been caused because of us, because of our behavior, but also we have learned how does it mean to act when we are facing an emergency? We used to say that we are in a climate emergency, but really we haven't adopted actions accordingly to that crisis. And we have learned of what Europe is doing under the recovery with the principle do no harm, linked to a long-term vision and connected with different kinds of strategies, yes, transition, biodiversity, climate, among some others. So to finish, let me share with you some main principles that in my point of view could help the discussion and could help us to convince decision makers how to green in the recovery. First element, we must link our recovery to the net zero vision. We do need to link the recovery with long-term vision. The second one it is that the recovery should be coherent with the transition that the science has suggested us to walk 
the energy transition, the land and ecosystem, the urban and infrastructure, and the industrial system. But also we will need to address what IPBES has recognized are the drivers of nature loss, pollution, natural resources use and exploitation, invasive species, climate change, among some others. A third element it is that we are in a time of convergence. Probably the only, the single virtue of this pandemic, it is that it has helped to integrate the agenda. So now we are more able to discuss about climate, nature, development, the economy, policy, and even politics. So convergence, it is a key element for the recovery. Fourth, we will need to promote labor intensive or, con or contribute with labor intensive solutions. Focus on clean employment, clean jobs, to clean energy for, for restoration, for reforestation, for sustainable agriculture, among some others. See, we do need to recognize that this recovery should be coherent with the new world economy, that it is focusing on address climate change and address nature loss. Six, it should be strongly rely on science. Seven, it should have a systemic approach. Eight, it should link with our country's commitment, and I am referring to the NDCs and also to the long-term strategy, to the MBSAPs, among some other commitments that we have under the International Convention. Ninth, it should be linked with health. So the idea of the One Health approach, it is a key one. And finally, it should recognize the potential of nature-based solutions that are exactly to promote sustainable interventions on nature, to promote economic benefit, social benefit, and nature benefit, and as a way to address societal challenge. So I hope that these ideas could help us under this discussion. So now let me introduce our strong moderator and thank you, Shardul. He's Shardul Agrawal, Head Environment and the Economy Integration Division from OECD, and he's going to moderate a strong panel. Thank you very much, and thank you again for being part of this high-level dialogue. Thanks very much, Manuel, for uh, the welcome and the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to moderate uh, this panel today. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me quickly go through some general housekeeping rules. Uh, so uh, for all of you who have joined us uh, in this webinar, you will see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And you can use that icon to post your questions to the speakers uh, throughout the webinar and we will collect the questions and uh, I will post them uh, to uh, as many of them to the panel as I can. Uh, you're also very welcome to tweet during the sessions and uh, we encourage you to use the hashtag uh, Green Recovery Dialogue, hashtag Green Recovery Dialogue uh, in your tweets. So that's all in terms of house, housekeeping uh, announcements. Now, let me come uh, to the topic of the day. So today we'll be discussing how we can build a nature positive economic recovery. Now, as countries around the globe are still reeling from the tragic consequences of COVID-19, dedicating today's webinar to nature uh, might seem a bit off sync, but let me tell you why that's not the case. Our disruption of ecosystems and the exploitation of wildlife may well be the reason why we are in this mess to begin with. Uh, between 1990 and 2015, we cut down native forests uh, almost 16 times the size of France. And if we don't make transformative changes now, we are likely to see further declines in nature. And with it, with it we'll be bringing ourselves ever closer to natural reservoirs of disease and disrupting processes within ecosystems that help keep these diseases in check. So the question of nature is very integral to the problem of COVID-19 that we are dealing with. COVID-19 recovery packages, and as all of you are aware, governments around the world are now investing trillions of dollars uh, to design and implement these recovery packages. Uh, but it's important that these packages recognize the importance of nature for human health, 
for well-being and for the economy. So one might ask, how can this be done? And we have a very distinguished panel to help address the questions. Uh, but let me throw a couple of ideas to get things started. So one obvious first step would be to screen and monitor the recovery packages that are being designed and implemented for their impact on nature. And, and that would be a logical first step. Another thing we can do is to turn a sharper focus on reforming subsidies that harm nature. And this can help free up financial resources while promoting long-term resilience. Just to put it in perspective, according to some research we did at the OECD before the COVID-19 crisis, government spending on subsidies harmful to biodiversity was at least five times more than total spending to protect biodiversity. A third measure uh, which we could uh, focus on and prioritize in the context of recovery is introducing and ramping up taxes on activities that harm biodiversity. And that can help partly offset the high costs of increased government spending and the reduction in labor tax revenues that we are experiencing right now. And finally, we must not overlook the potential of nature-based jobs to get people back to work quickly while promoting resilient and well-functioning ecosystems. So that's all from me at the moment, uh, just as an appetizer based on some thinking we've done at the OECD. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel today. Uh, before I do so, I would like to inform you that unfortunately, uh, due to personal reasons, Professor Sir Partha Das Gupta, who uh, was supposed to be part of this panel, uh, had to cancel at the last minute and would unfortunately not be able to join us today. But we are fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of speakers, and it's my pleasure to introduce each one of them. So we have uh, Teresa Ribera, who's the Vice President of Spain and Minister for Ecological Transition and Democratic Challenge. Uh, Teresa will be giving uh, opening remarks in a pre-recorded video address. And then we have three panel members who will be live and uh, engaging in an active discussion. Uh, we have Alicia Barcena, who's the Executive Secretary of UNECLAC, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have Professor Patricia Balvanera, who's the co-chair of Values Assessment at the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, as many of you uh, know the acronym. And finally, we have uh, Gabrielle Kehandria, who's the Vice Minister of Strategic Development of Natural Resources from uh, the Ministry of Environment in Peru. So with those introductions, uh, now I would uh, um, start uh, the session uh, with, uh, by listening to some introductory remarks by Teresa Rivera, Vice President of Spain and the Minister for Ecological Transition. Good afternoon, uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation to join you. I will be missing the opportunity to be with you, but I want to send a very warm message to all the institutions behind this initiative. I think that the OECD, the, Euro the Environment Defense Fund, and the Natural Conservancy, together with all the other friends uh, being part of this initiative, are making a great job. I think it is very important, the message is clear, and well understood by everybody. There is no future if it is not green. There is no possibility to recover a last, a lasting or taking a lasting recovery if it is not well sound, well founded in the uh, in the limits within the limits uh, of the planet and our um, balance in terms of biodiversity and nature. And this is what you are promoting. We have an opportunity to rediscover what it means for the world and for the human prosperity to do it green. And energy, biodiversity, so ecosystems, ground ecosystems, maritime ecosystems, so the ocean and water, are key drivers to think about what to do with the climate, with the prosperity of the people, with inclusiveness when dealing with opportunities, and how to accept uh, to the benefits uh, provided by the ecosystems without putting them at risk, at the danger. And um, I think that uh, we must work together in this field. 
That's what we are doing in Spain. That's what we are doing in Europe. A Green New Deal that facilitates a proper green recovery. But it needs to be inclusive and solidar. Biodiversity is essential to life. Climate is essential to life. We need climate and biodiversity for our health, for our economy, for our prosperity. And we have uh, suddenly found an expected a uh, opportunity to invest in recovering our biodiversity, our economy, and to reorientate our way of life and our way of prosperity and development. Uh, we have been suffering a terrible pandemic. We have been suffering a terrible virus that has put the whole humankind under the same menace, the same threat. And now we want to recover, we want to create jobs, we want to invest in our future, and we want to do it in a safe manner. And this is why a green recovery makes sense. We in Spain are trying to do so. We think that jobs, long-lasting business opportunities to rely on what type of uh, prosperity and development we want to build. And this is energy transition, this is green infrastructures, this is investment in biodiversity, in a much more greener agricultural pattern, in a much more uh, compatible way to understand our urban life and our mobility. This is a great fantastic opportunity to use a green driver to innovate our industrial policies, our industrial responses, and a marvelous and a fantastic opportunity to cooperate with our neighbors and worldwide with those willing to invest in our maritime, in our green, in our biodiversity, in our forest, in our uh, uh, way to produce goods and consume them. We have uh, gone through uh, the Parliament to get a climate uh, law. We have uh, developed a very interesting renewable energy strategy, so to make it real, not just because of the green electrons, but also because of the, in the industrial goods that are in the whole value chain. We have uh, promoted a circular economy strategy that uh, provides new opportunities to our materials and new ways to produce and consume uh, things. And we are investing in our biodiversity strategy, in our uh, uh, a forestry strategy so to ensure that a much more balanced way to understand life in an urban context, in the rural context, do make sense in the time to come. Thank you very much uh, Teresa Rivera for uh, sharing your thoughts on how we can take uh, this opportunity to shape our recovery in a green manner that is oriented within our planetary boundaries and in designing how we exit from the short-term crisis, uh, we can shape our future in a way that will last for the long term. And the emphasis you place in terms of reorienting our way of life, prosperity and development, and uh, also the priorities you highlighted uh, for your government uh, in terms of the, the climate law that you have passed, the renewable energy strategy, and uh, the biodiversity and forestry strategies uh, that uh, you are in the process of shaping. So now I'd like to uh, move to the panel discussion part of this uh, webinar. And to kick things off, let me first turn to Professor Patricia Balvenera, who's the co-chair values assessment of uh, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose uh, one question to each of the three panelists and the panelists will have between uh, three to five minutes to respond to the question. Uh, in the meantime, I encourage uh, the participants uh, in the webinar to uh, send in their uh, questions and I'll, I'll select a few questions and then uh, pose the questions to the panelists after this initial round. So uh, coming back to you, uh, Patricia, um, this whole issue of putting biodiversity and nature conservation uh, at the center of the economic discourse uh, is not new. Uh, I mean, it's been 28 years since uh, the CBD was agreed upon. And we've had a number of good initiatives, uh, a decade uh, since the creation of the IPBEST platform. We've had uh, the uh, the famous uh, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity team report and, and there's a major uh, review led by professor das gupta which is underway in the uk right now 
but it still looks that we are failing and we haven't been able to mainstream nature into economic decisions. So in your view, what needs to change uh, to have nature and nature conservation to be a more central part of the economic discourse? And how can we take advantage of this context we are in right now in the context of the COVID-19 recovery to mainstream nature into these decisions? Patricia, over to you. Yes, thank you very much for the kind invitation to this panel. I'm really thrilled to be talking to all of you and to be part of this wonderful initiative. So the first thing that needs to change is that we all need to be aware of the severity of the nature crisis and the risks it entails. Thanks to the climate community and specifically to the IPCC, Climate change today is embedded in local to global policies, in financial incentives, in, even in the campaigns no, of youth activists. But most of us don't really understand the full magnitude and the consequence of the nature crisis. IBES has been created only eight years ago and is working in the direction, but there's so much to be done. The global assessment released last year very clearly show that the matrix that sustains our life on earth has become thinner, smaller, and more fragile. And that biodiversity loss is threatened the achievement, the achievement of most of the sustainable development goals. For the first time ever, the nature crisis and for instance, the one million threatened species message became headline news in 50 languages, 150 countries, reaching more than 30 billion people. So we're only starting. And for instance, the World Economic Forum has been highlighting the nature loss as a key strategic element of their global risk reports in the last year. The second thing that needs to change is the dominant narrative on the role of nature in economic development. Nature is largely seen as an inexhaustible factory mm -hmm. of the food we eat and of the ores we use to produce cell phones, as the next vacation destination or as a huge trash bin where we dispose our plastic garbage. Mm -hmm. We are growingly see, seeing picturing, picturing in our minds trees sucking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to mitigate climate change and mangroves and coral reefs protecting us from the impacts of ever stronger hurricanes. But very seldom we see nature as the filter of the water we drink, the nursing home of the fish we eat, the bees that pollinate our almonds or the land that nurtures our identity. The emergence of SARS-CoV-2, as well as the locust plagues in Eastern Africa, have crudely and vividly brought home the role of nature in regulating detrimental organisms. The cascading econo economic collapses we are starting to see following COVID-19 spread have reminded us of the role of nature as an insurance, as the basis for resilience, for the capacity to withstand and recover from dramatic shifts, such as the one we are experiencing now. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Patricia. Uh, some very important points that you've made in terms of the lack of visibility, both of the destruction of nature that is occurring and also the lack of visibility of the many services that nature and uh, ecosystems provide us and the need to change the dominant narrative that nature is not an inexhaustible resource, which many of us intuitively just take for granted. So uh, there's lots of food for thought there and I'm tempted to ask many more questions, but first let me uh, you know, pose uh, the first questions to our other two panelists. So I'd like to now uh, turn to uh, Alicia Barsena, who's the Executive Secretary of UN ECLAC. Um, Alicia, in ECLAC's recent publication, uh, The Climate Change Emergency in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, with, with the 
very provocative second half of the title, will we wait for the catastrophe or will we move on to action? Uh, you mentioned what uh, structural loss to the economy could occur if we let our greenhouse gas emissions continue in a business as usual scenario. Now, connecting the climate issue to the focus of today's discussion, uh, which is nature conservation, uh, what are the structural economic impacts in your view uh, that uh, one could see from the combined impact of climate change and uh, the loss of nature? And how can we address some of these uh, structural impacts uh, particularly in the context of our economic recovery priorities uh, that governments are facing right now. Uh, Alicia, over to you. Thank you so much. And let me just uh, share very quickly um, a, a very short, uh, because to, to address the costs, we need some graphs. So this is the, the book that you are talking about. And the economic cost that we calculate in this book and the impact of climate change is five, five main, five main things. First of all, we estimated the cost associated with the physical impacts. If we get to 2.5 uh, uh, centigrade temperate rise, the range will be between 1% and 5% of the region GDP. And that will be in the next uh, uh, 10 to 20 years. And it depends of course on each country. So this is an, a regional average. Between 90, 1970 and 2019, Latin America was hit by 2,300 disasters. And according to the figures, these events have already costed two, 297 million people, costing over $437 billion. And this is tremendous. We have impacted the GDP, particularly of Caribbean countries and very highly sensitive sectors. What are the structural sectors that will be hardly hit? Agriculture. Agriculture has, uh, is so important in our region. It's 6% of the regional GDP. And it is, it is also connected to the water challenges, the droughts, the health effects, and the high impact in coastal areas. The fourth issue is what, what my colleague Patricia was mentioning. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is the home of eight of the, of the 17 mega diverse countries. And it's located in the Andes Amazon basin in Mesoamerica, which shows already a decrease of 89% in the abundance of species population. And since 19, 1970. So this is a very dramatic loss of one of the biogeographical world areas, most importantly. And the decline in the, in the next, in, during this century might be of 13%. Now let me show you quickly the vulnerability, for example, of the, uh, what, what the adverse climate change on the economy may occur within, the, 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 within less than 10 years. If we don't do anything, if, the, if we continue with the business as usual, these are the losses that we calculate in terms of GDP per capita. So GDP per capita will be lost in, in countries like Peru, like Argentina, uh, like, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, of course, is very, very hard. We're talking about uh, losses of per capita GDP in relation to the GDP today. So this is very, very important in case we don't do anything. Uh, and let me show here something that is tremendous, uh, uh, dear moderator Shardul, because these are the cities. This is the total land that is below five meters in our region population that is living below five meters. Look at the Caribbean. These are the, the most affected countries in our region that are going to be underwater if we, if we don't do something uh, soon. So uh, this is very important. Now you say, what are the drivers? What are the main drivers that we identify in this book? And we identify the following drivers. First of all, look at what's happening in our region. The emissions, the greenhouse emissions in our region are coming mostly from agricultural and land use changes in the region and versus what's happening in the rest of the world, which is basically energy. You can see this in the graph. So we are, we are thinking and we put the costing and the benefits of non-conventional renewable energy on nature-based solutions, on circular economy, on recycling, on smart cities, 
digitization, sustainable buildings and, and digital economy, which is dematerialization, resilient infrastructure, and less polluting consumption. And we calculated, for example, in, in, in each of these sectors, if we go for renewable energy, this will be must, much more economical, much more cost beneficial than uh, for, uh, fossil fuels. You can see here how much uh, the, the low fossil fuel is costing and how much we can gain, we can have if we go for solar, wind or other type of renewables. And we also calculated what is the contribution of, of each uh, gigawatt of energy in, for example, in the case of Chile. If we, if we go for renewables, we will have a value added generation that is superior twice what fossil fuel can bring. So we have to demonstrate this with numbers, with evidence, so we can convince the policymakers that renewable energy can generate jobs. We also calculated how much jobs could be generated in Brazil and in Mexico if we go for uh, renewable energies in the construction, in the operation, in the maintenance. So we definitely believe that we have uh, a great opportunities here uh, if we go for renewable options. And of course, one of the things that I heard from, from my friend Manuel Pulgar is that we have to be very careful because this crisis is causing setbacks on environmental regulations and budgets. And that for me is, is very worrisome. I see this in Brazil, in Chile, in Mexico, and, 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 and the environmental standards have been relaxed and the budgets have been going down. And we cannot afford this. The, the next crisis that is coming up is climate change and, and, and biodiversity loss. So we better be, make sure that we understand what we are confronting a public, uh, the, the, a public bad, which is a pandemic, but the one that is coming on is the climate change and biodiversity. We have to act now. And building back better in Latin America means building back better with equality and with sustainability. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Alicia, for that uh, very passionate speech. Uh, it's a very impressive report uh, that you shared the findings from. Uh, the messages I take is that to make a strong policy case, you, and this echoes what Patricia was also saying, you need to quantify what the damage is and, and that you have shown uh, in terms of the impacts of climate change, also the vulnerability of uh, the low lying areas to impacts of sea level rise. Uh, you also made the connection to nature conservation and biodiversity because Latin America is home to eight of the 17 megadiverse uh, countries. And and also connecting climate change to nature conservation, the biggest driver of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in your context is agriculture and land use. And, and so many of the responses you might need for nature conservation are closely tied to the climate problem. So I'd like to thank you again uh, for your opening intervention. And now I'm going to, uh, uh, you also concluded with the concern about rollbacks of environmental regulations and standards uh, in, uh, in, in the post-COVID world. So now let me turn to our third panelist who is a national decision maker, uh, Gabriel uh, Kehandria. He's the Vice Minister for Strategic Development of Natural Resources, uh, Ministry of Environment in Peru. And Gabriel, I wanted to talk to you about deforestation and land use, uh, given that, as we just discussed, uh, they are the main sources of emissions in Latin American tropical countries, uh, but the drivers of deforestation and land use uh, are mainly because of poverty, socioeconomic condition, and poor law enforcement. Now, how can we avoid that the economic crisis that we are in right now um, won't drive more deforestation? Uh, because it seems that some of the underlying drivers might be even more acute in, in the context of that we face ourselves right now. And, also, I'd like to ask you how we can build nature-related social capital at, at, at all levels, uh, again, taking your expertise as a national policymaker. Uh, Gabriel, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Shardul, and thank you, um, the, the organizers, for the, for the opportunity to, to share with you some, some thoughts. Uh, coming from from our national perspective, but but I think that can, that can be scaled uh, to, to cover a, a global a global view or, or to be part of a global view 
apply, uh, applicable to, to, to all developing countries. What we've seen is uh, with, with, with COVID-19 is that we are facing uh, a, new, a new challenge, a new, a new threat. We, we had, uh, haven't been able to, to solve the deforestation problem, and now we have to, to, to deal with, with uh, extra, extra problems uh, over, over those we, we had in the, in, in the rural context. Now we have to deal with people uh, coming back from cities, escaping poverty, escaping COVID. We've seen it in Lima, we've seen it in, Bom in Bomba, Mumbai, in, in India. We've seen that uh, these uh, seasonal migrant workers uh, from, from Guatemala being unable to move to Canada to work in the harvest there. And then they have to, uh, been kept in, in, their, in, their, in their lands, in their villages, uh, generating pressure or more pressure over the natural resources and, and the environment. So what, what we should do to, 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 to deal with this? And, 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 and some of you will be, might, might be surprised but, but about what, what we, I will say, because you, you might think nothing, nothing new in, in what this guy says, but, but uh, the thing is, there are, there are not many new things to do, but to deepen what the, the, the transitions that we, we already involved in and, and, and to go faster with them. Uh, go faster with the transition to, to sustainable energy, go faster with the transition to, to electromobility in the, in, in, in the urban, ur, urban realms, but, but, but go, go faster in the, in the deforestation free uh, production change change in the in the rural sector so I, I think there are certain certain issues and certain things that we we need to move and, and we need to push for we need to to ensure that that basic services are there in place in the rural sector uh, not only for the people that is coming back but for the people that stay there and has been staying there uh, in, 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 in in all this time. But, but we need to think in, in, in new basic uh, service services. We, 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 need to, to, we, we need to stop thinking about that crazy highway that connects nothing with nothing in the middle of the jungle and, and, uh, and start to think about uh, why don't we uh, think about an endowment that uh, finances a weekly aerial connection? Or why don't we think about a high speed internet? How do we include nature following this green infrastructure uh, approach uh, as, part, as part of the solution? Why don't we invest in the, the recovery of, of wetlands, in the recovery of this uh, green infrastructure that can help uh, to, to, to elevate the, the, the productivity of, of, of economic activities happening in the, in the, in the rural sector? And to raise this, this, this productivity, then this is the second point, how to de dematerialize the economy. We don't need the highway. We need the high speed, the, the high speed internet is more needed to, to allow for the financial uh, operations to happen rapidly and, 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 and for, the, for the money and, and for the benefits to reach these, these areas without, without destroying the, uh, all, all the way uh, from, from, from the city to this remote town where, where, where you produce something that is, that is valuable for, for, the, for the market. We don't need to, 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 to buy this, to, to build this uh, highway to, to do this. The, the, technology, the, the technology right now allows us to, to, to avoid that. We need also, and, and this is a third thing, to facilitate access to the forest for those promoting good business ideas. Access to forests in developing countries is difficult, and it's difficult for, uh, most difficult for people that is poor. Uh, and it, it, it's, 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 it's always easier for those who have, who have money, and, and, and it's easier for those who have black money, those involved in, in illegal mining, those involved in illegal timber, Harvesting, so we need as 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 a state, as 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 regulators, as as policymakers, facilitate the access for indigenous communities, for those promoting good ideas, for those that are uh, capable or or are com are committed to keep the forest standing, to make business and to use sustainably the forest, but keeping keeping it standing, not 
uh, thinking that the forest is a problem, but an opportunity. We need for, for the issue to promote organization. In the case of Peru, for instance, 70% of our coffee are, and cocoa producers are not affiliated to any association or cooperative. And that, that uh, keeps them in uh, disadvantage, in disadvantage in terms of fixing a, 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 fair, a fair price in, in, in terms of accessing, accessing technology, of accessing um, technical, technical assistance. So we need to work in, in that. Access to finance. We need to, 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 to provide access to finance to, to, to these producers. We need to bankerize them. We need to bankerize those that, can, that could be bankerized, but we need to, to, to think uh, about, about other measures, think out of the box, strengthen the cooperatives, strengthen all these other and new um, means for, for accessing finance that are, that are available. Use the technology use blockchain, use uh, all these uh, creations, use the creativity of the people to, to, to reach these remote areas and, 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 and reduce the pressure over, over the forest. Sixth point, involve the private sector, but not any private sector. Involve the private sector that it's willing to take the challenge, that it's willing to, to, to change the, 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 business, the business mode or the business model. That, that it's, that it's uh, willing to work with NGOs, with communities. It's willing to share the risk with them, but it's willing also to share the benefits and not uh, think about the community as simple provider of workforce or, or the space where, 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 my, where my business will happen. And finally, incorporate conservation as part of the toolkit for, for, for solving uh, development problems. I don't know if you see, if you've been able to see this this recent report of the campaign for nature that shows that 30, 30 the protection of the thirty percent of the of the earth could produce four uh, four hundred and fifty billion dollars in 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 returns in in economic returns uh, and 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 that's that's it's that's it's good news that is a good good uh, investment of money. For instance, in 2017, we did a study here in Peru and we found that every dollar invested in protected areas in Peru returned about 40 in direct, uh, in direct benefits to local people related to uh, tourism happening in these protected areas. Tell me if that is not a good business. Tell me if that is not a good option for recovery other than, 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 than than giving subsidies to, to, to transportation, to giving uh, bad subsidies as, as, as Alicia was, was saying. So what, what we need to do is to change our, our chip and, and stop walking and start running and, and stop uh, being, being shallow and, 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 and only scrapping, scrapping the surface and, and, go, and go deeper. But as, as, you, as you see, there are no, no, no news or no new measures proposed here. All of them uh, have been said or have been written or have been implemented in, in some, somewhere else. We have to go deeper with this. We have to go stronger with this. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, Gabriel. Uh, again, uh, a lot of food for thought here. I think the first point that you mentioned is, is something I've not uh, seen mentioned before, which is, uh, this whole phenomena of reverse migration from cities back to rural areas and the fact that it might uh, end up exacerbating the pressures on uh, nature which were already there and, and that indeed is a very direct consequence of, uh, of, of the pandemic uh, which many countries you mentioned mm -hmm. not just Peru but also India and many other countries are experiencing uh, and in terms of what to do, you really laid out a very comprehensive set of priorities in terms of reinforcing uh, measures and sustainable energy, electromobility, and so on, but also in terms of prioritizing the provision of basic services, encouraging better access uh, to forests for those who can use it sustainably, but also better access to finance and how to meaningfully engage the private sector. So thank you again uh, for, for, for your remarks. I'm going to now take a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. Um, one uh, 
question uh, that has been uh, posed is how do you make sure that uh, the because a lot of this discourse on green recovery and and there's there's been a lot that's been happening in the last couple of months is largely at the international level it's either international organizations or national policy makers and how do you ensure that the priorities for a greener recovery actually reach uh, the local level uh, i think gabriele you already mentioned some points so maybe let me first start with uh, Patricia or Alicia, either one of you, if you'd like to address that. Yes, actually, um, I think it is very important to understand the very specific context in different regions. And so many of these solutions are thought in a totally different context. And it is very important to bring the solutions to the specific needs, the specific biodiversity, the specific sustainability issues, and the specific no local knowledge in different areas. So these nature-based solutions uh, need to be co-designed where in, uh, according to the local context, rather than having a package that suits every need. Thanks very much, Patricia. Alicia, do you have any thoughts? Yes, thank you so much. I saw a very interesting question about how do we ensure that the renewables do not increase the mining, for example. And I think it's a very, very important point because many renewables are dependable of uh, lithium, for example, or cobalt. But definitely that would be less, uh, I would say, less impactful than the current mining extractive industries we have. We have calculated the dematerialization from our region. Instead of calculating the exports in terms of value of the exports that we are sending abroad, for example, the value of copper or the value of, of, of gold, etc., we are calculating how much materials are we exporting and, and how much we are dematerializing our, our, our land, our natural resources. And I think this is something we have to understand. And I think the other thing I want to, and, and of course, there is something that is true, and that is what are, how can we adapt the grid of, of, of our, our systems, our infrastructure, to make sure that they can receive these uh, different types of uh, renewable energies. There is one region in our, in our in, in one sub-region in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean which is ready for that, and that is Central America. It's the most advanced in terms of grid, and they can receive all types of energy, so that's a perfect place where we can go in the first stage. Secondly, I want to take your point uh, that you made at the, at the beginning on the energy subsidies. I think we have a tremendous opportunity here that now that the oil prices are down to see if we can, if we can look at the, at, the, at the fossil fuel subsidies more seriously and most importantly on gasoline. This is of course a very difficult thing to do in terms of the, of the social uh, costs. But we have to think about it. We really need to think about it. And finally, let me say that I am totally with Gabriel that we have to reset the global, the global economy. We have to reset our thinking and even think about a new rural development, a new, I would say, an agroecological transition. That's what we need, an agroecological transition and a forestry transition. And I have to say, that the World Economic Forum, for example, put forward a very important target, and that is one trillion uh, trees per year. We have to go back to that and make sure that, that this becomes a good business and that is reforestation. And also how to, uh, to move away from, from the pressure we have on the cities. 80% of the population in Latin America is living in cities. And, and, and so, and now people are going back to the rural areas because they feel safer in their, in their homeland. That's what they're doing. So how do we help that, the, uh, that migration back to the rural areas with investment on agroecological projects? I think this would be extremely interesting if we are able to do that. Over to you, Sharu. Thanks very much, uh, Alicia. Uh, Gabriela, I wanted to come back to you. You, you laid out, uh, you made a very strong case that, uh, you know, we need to do even more to bring nature at the, as the center of our policy efforts. But 
I, I just would like to know about the conversations you have with your minister, minister of health or minister of finance right now in the midst of the pandemic and the economic crisis. How much resonance do you see for uh, these priorities that you highlighted? Uh, do people connect it outside your ministry uh, in, with, with the same degree of concern? Or are people saying we have other emergencies right now? Let's deal with them first. So what's the general response and how do you ensure that the recovery of Peru is green? It's, it's difficult because we public bureaucrats tend, tend to have, have the natural tendency to, to avoid coordination. At least, at least here in Peru, or, and I think that's a problem that can be can be extended to any developing country. Uh, but 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 I think the 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 pandemic has 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 allowed us to discuss some some issues that that, that used to be taboo for before. Uh, right now, there are, there are certain certain issues that were and undiscussable before 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 the pandemic and, and now we, we have been able to to, to open uh, certain certain space for for discussion for instance uh, we, we have always had uh, uh, problems with the Ministry of Transportation not being sufficient sufficiently uh, transparent in, in terms of the planning of the of the roads uh, they are they are they are promoting in in, in the Amazon in the Amazon area in Peru uh, right now, there is there, there is this big uh, recovery program that is providing uh, resources to municipalities, local level, district level municipalities, to do uh, road recovery uh, around around the, the country. So we have been able to uh, to, to to give a to give a view to to, to have a view on uh, this this this. Uh, this specific uh, road program before they launch it to the to, to the before the Ministry of the Transportation launches to, uh, launches it to the to the to the to the mayors uh, for us to uh, exclude those those roads that are non-existent or that are related to illegal activity or there are uh, threatening protected areas or certain uh, areas that are important for for their ecosystem services and that is something that has never happened before uh, that that is that is an openness openness that we we've never seen uh, before and, and 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 we are trying to to build a permanent dialogue with them uh, from from now on uh, allowing us to, to to have a say in 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 their planning and and, and the deployment of, of big chunks of, of money going going to to remote areas and and and, and, and we are trying to, to to do a second a second turn uh, how do we participate in the in, in the prioritization of, of, of those roads that are the good ones those roads that will provide the most benefit uh, if, if they are built, if they if they are renewed, if they, if, if they receive um, re, re recovery, if they, they are recovered, and and, uh, and and that's the next the next phase. And we are doing this with, with, with different with different ministries. But this is an, an interesting case that that that, that I, I wanted to highlight. Uh, back to you, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gabriel. Uh, Tricia, let me come back to you. You mentioned uh, nature-based solutions, and indeed, in the international discourse, there's a lot of talk about nature-based solutions. Uh, but my question to you is, how can we make nature-based solutions uh, the strongest possible mechanism to address societal challenges and, and to internalize the economic benefits that such solutions provide? Yes, thank you. So First, definitely by addressing directly the drivers of change, the direct drivers of change that have been identified, for instance, by IBEST, no? reducing land and seascape change, uh, reducing resources, uh, extraction from nature, addressing climate change, reducing pollution, or the proliferation of invasive species, alien species, and keeping within planetary boundaries. We also have been hearing about um, developing the right financial incentives. No? So, strategies to address harmful incentives, 
Red Plus, for instance, and payments for ecosystem services have had their advantages, but there are things that need, need to be refined. And there are important initiatives, uh, like the Das Gupta Report and the Natural Capital Accounting Initiatives by the UN that will be released by uh, early next year. But there are other dimensions. For instance, being mindful of who bears the benefits and who bears the cost and where they're distributed. So trade has shifted where goods are produced and used. And this is great for opening new economic opportunities, but it also has generated or exacerbated important inequities in economic development and environmental burden. So for instance, per capita consumption is four times larger in developed countries, while resource extraction is the highest in middle income countries and pollution is highest both in developing and least, sorry, yeah, in developing and least developed countries. Um, by second, also, by assessing the costs and benefits of, along a wide range of dimensions of well being. Yes, for instance, clean energy initiatives provide important economic and climate benefits, jobs. But what about biodiversity, cost of benefits? What about the cost of displacing people from the lands that are very important to the preservation of their culture or their? or their heritage and how to factor those in. Also, by being mindful of power imbalances between the actors and the institutions that are negotiating these solutions. Large corporations, for instance, control very large shares of the supply chains in agriculture, fishing, logging, and mining. And they offer them wonderful solutions for these um, nature-based, wonderful opportunities for these nature-based solutions. But they have a huge influence in democratic processes in many countries. And these could jeopardize the long-term benefits. And for instance, the huge amount of environmental conflicts around the world are probably one symptom of uh, these problems. And they could certainly be exacerbated by COVID. Also, by unleashing values of responsibility and reciprocity towards nature. For example, Nat so nature-based solutions entail care and commitment. For example, for the tomatoes we grow in the roof, we develop attachment, care, the same way we develop for members of our family or for community, and move away from this use and trash relationship. I'm also having trouble hearing uh, Patricia. I think there's a problem uh, with the connection. So. Uh, while that's addressed, let me uh, turn. Uh, let me turn to you, Alicia. Um, you uh, you made a strong case uh, when you were presenting the highlights of your report uh, of the need for transformational structural change. And in that context, I wanted to ask you which nature-related sectors can help promote this transformational structural change that you're calling for, and which actions uh, sh uh, should we privilege in terms of uh, in terms of priorities thank you so much and and indeed i will i would say that uh, first of all i think the agricultural sector has to be one of them mm -hmm. and uh, the agricultural sector is also a very important export sector in latin america and the caribbean but we have to change the way we do this that is we need a truly agroecological transformation in the sense that we have to rescue, uh, we have to go from a single crop to, to, a, to a diverse crop. I mean, I, I think that, for example, in the, in the Maya region or in the indigenous people region, we used to cultivate corn together with, uh, with uh, beans, together with uh, cabbage. And this combination had a lot of sense because it was uh, nutritious. I mean, the, the, we have to find how to restore the soil because that's another, the land erosion is happening so, so rapidly. So we need to, to really take seriously the agricultural sector and talk to the transnational corporations about this because uh, we, the nature-based solutions and most particularly, I think in the, in the, in the case of agriculture is a very important part. The second one is fisheries. I was the director of uh, the National Institute of Fisheries in my country, and I believe that we can do a lot better in terms of fisheries. 
instead of having an extractive approach to fisheries, uh, these are uh, resources that can be highly sustainable if they are well managed. But for that, we have to also protect the mangroves, for example. We have to protect the, the, uh, the, the, the coastal areas in a different way, mm -hmm. and we can combine fisheries with aquaculture. I think this is a sector that can bring a lot of profits to, to, to us in, in the future. And the other one is forestry. Forestry, uh, but we have to put the right value to forestry. That is, we have to pay for the production of oxygen, not only for the production of, of, of wood. So we have to change the way we are, uh, are approaching the, uh, the, the, the elements of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of the forestry. So I truly believe that agriculture, forestry, and, uh, and, and fisheries could be mm -hmm. A very three very important sectors uh, for the uh, nature-based solutions, and of course, I would say that uh, we have to go back to our past. and And I have to say that Peru has a lot of history on this. Uh, Mexico has a lot of history on this. Why not? We have to go back to our ancestors and take the best of their experiences back home and see how best we can use this. So uh, I believe this could be extremely important. And then. But finally, I would say a community solutions. I would go back to a collective community solutions, including health. I mean, we have to combine health. Uh, I mean, uh, I would say primary health uh, services in the communities with, with, uh, with uh, I would say, for example, with, with uh, healthy nutrition, for example. Because today, since we are facing a hunger uh, threat, because listen to these figures, uh, Shardul. Uh, we are calculating in ECLAC, we are going to have a contraction of 9% of GDP in this region. And we're going to have 250 million people in poverty and 95 million in extreme poverty. These 95 million in extreme poverty are going to, have, are going to be hungry because they don't have enough money to buy the food. So why don't we bring them back to, to be producers of food? And, and talking about food security, I think, for example, Caribbean countries are facing a tremendous problem right now because they are net importers of food. They have to rescue back their way of producing food again. And they have the oceans. The, the blue economy has to be an alternative for the Caribbean countries, for example. So let, just let me put those examples to you. Thanks very much, Alicia. Um, I, I, I don't know if, Patricia, you're back on my... I think you are. Uh, Is it working? It's working. We actually got uh, most of your response. I think we just lost the yes. last five seconds. I think the last one is actually very um, uh, well connected to what Alicia was saying. So I, my last point is to manage system level resilience in the face of uncertainty and complexity. And so for that, because very strange scenarios can come true, like this nightmare of the post-COVID world. We really need resilience based on, as Alicia was saying, these strategies, for instance, the agroecological solutions that are, have multiple solutions. So one uh, agroecological opportunity has so many different benefits in terms of climate, in terms of soil fertility regulation, livelihoods, economy, food security, food sovereignty. But also these are made up with many different species, not just one species to maximize yield, but rather to have different species that play different roles. And we, these are really based on very different types of knowledge systems. So we can make the best of, for instance, the Asian Maya Milpa, but also incorporate the most recent findings of physiology or agroecology and really together design these very resilient, robust and diverse systems that are important for different dimensions of food security and different dimensions of well-being, economy, livelihoods and, and health and so on. Uh, thanks very much, Patricia. And what you said uh, connects very well with what Alicia was saying. Uh, I think the emphasis on system resilience, diversification, and also while we look to the future, we also need to go back to traditional methods and learn from 
what our ancestors used to do. Um, let me uh, turn now to Gabrielle for the next uh, question. Uh, taking it a bit uh, a step up here, um, I think often one says that we, we are still struggling a bit to build a solid narrative that can strengthen the connection between nature and economy uh, that uh, politicians can understand, that the public can buy into. Uh, so based on your experience as uh, natural resources vice minister and your experience in the climate debate also, what else could we do to build a stronger and more convincing narrative between the nature and the economy? I, I think to, we, we the, the, the ministries of, of the environment, for, for, for instance, uh, or the, the environmentalists in, in, in general, need, need to, to, to learn in, in, uh, to, to speak using hard data. We need to, 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 to do this transition to, to, to this result-based uh, management or, or this uh, evidence-based evidence uh, decision-making decision that, for instance, in the case of Peru has happened in the, in the social sectors, that our, our Ministry of, of Social Development has a strong backing for, for all the policies and all the measures they, they, they propose in terms of, of the impact uh, in, 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 in health, in terms, uh, in terms of the impact in, 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 in education, in terms of the impact in, in, in labor. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, we, are, we are starting to do that. We, we need to incorporate uh, economists in the ministries of the environment and produce these uh, reports and these documents that show that investment uh, that nature, nature-based investment or nature, nature-positive investment is is good and is competitive uh, compared with compared with the with the traditional gray or or not so nature-friendly um, investment. Um, it's complicated because uh, we 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 are we have been asked for for something that it's that that with questions that are not asked to the to the ministries of transportation or or agriculture they they not ask for the for the about the sustainability of their interventions but 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 in our case we are we are asked about the sustainability of interventions but also we have to demonstrate that they are economically feasible economically competitive competitive but those are the rules of 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 the game and and well that that much change must change in, in the future, but while while it happens, we we, we need to 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 build muscle in, in in terms of our capacity to to engage in this in these discussions, showing in their in their own language, in the language of these decision makers that do not take uh, in 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 account that, that so importantly. Uh, the, the, the things of, of, of resilience, uh, things as resilience or, or, or the loss of biodiversity, and put it in, 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 economic, in economic terms and, and show them that these are uh, investments or these are decisions that could cost more than, than, than the benefits they, they generate. Thank you, Shardu. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gabriel. And uh, I think you mentioned something which is very fundamental. I think the environmental side, uh, the, the environmental ministries always have this challenge to make a stronger economic case uh, for the measures they are proposing. Um, I wanted to turn it around actually and ask all the panelists, uh, you know, what can we do to uh, ensure that the measures that other parts of the government uh, might be implementing are green? I mean, how do we define criteria to assess the greenness of projects and investments. Uh, you know, we, uh, in, within our own community, we, we take it for granted, but do you have any thoughts on establishing clear criteria that, that we could use? Uh, so it's not just the economic sustainability of environmental activities, it's also the environmental sustainability of economic investments. And how do we do that uh, in a better way? So any one of you who has any thoughts, please just raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. Okay, I'll start. Okay. <clears throat> so I think one set of criterias would have to do 
in terms of greenness today, we think about climate, but we forget about biodiversity. So of course, some of the dimensions will have to do with climate mitigation and adaptation. We definitely need to have dimensions relative to biodiversity. And relative to biodiversity, we could have some dimensions directly linked to the kind of biodiversity, the amount and kind of biodiversity that is being part of this nature-based solution. How many species, how much agrobiodiversity, and so on. But also, we probably need to go to this concept of nature's contributions to people. So we can think about green um, solutions in terms of how much they really link to the different contributions for nature, food production, and much more than that, the maintenance of the processes through time. But then another dimension would have to be with the possibility of maintaining the processes through time, which is the sustainability component, which is how much this is really allowing for regeneration through time and maintaining rather than degrading the capacity to maintain through time. And finally, I will go for resilience. So the resilience in terms of the maintenance of options, the opportunities to really respond. And, and maybe I'm, I'm thinking the last one will have to do with this interconnected regime shift and collapses. So I think greenness has really be very aware of how much it is contributing or moving away from potential regime shifts dramatic collapses and interconnected collapses. Thanks very much, Patricia. Alicia, please. I, I think you're raising a very crucial question and, and it's very crucial for the following reasons. I, I participated in my, in my professional life at the beginning in the environmental sector. I was the, the first vice minister of ecology in Mexico. Uh, and I realized that from the environmental perspective, we will never going to win this, uh, this battle. So we have to move to economics. And, and now that I'm the head of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, I have put almost all the economists of this, uh, of this institution to think together with me about something that we are calling the big environmental push, which is how do we recover the economy? I mean, we, we, cannot, we, cannot, uh, we cannot ignore the fact that, that there is a conflict in terms of growing. Uh, what, what our countries want to do is to grow at any rate, at any cost, number one. They, they want to bring foreign direct investment at any cost, even with, with criteria that are raised to the bottom. So what are the roots of this conflict uh, of interest that we have to look into? And how do we sit in the table those big investors of our region, let me put you an example, the mining industry. The mining industry in the world, and it's, it's, it's a very few companies, by the way, it's not a lot of companies. There are very few transnational corporations. And one thing we have done, for example, in ECLAC, is we have brought the transnational corporations of mining with the ministers of mining of our region to try to understand, because we have more than 240 conflicts uh, social environmental conflicts in our region because of the conflicts between mining and water and biodiversity. So, uh, but, but we are not going to succeed unless, unless the big investors understand that we want a different path and that we also can look at the cost benefit analysis together with the private sector. So one, one of the, th because really, and we have not been able to to achieve these goals yet. Look at what's happening now in the pandemic. What, what, what the governments are doing is they want to grow at any rate. They want to reopen the economy at any rate. And my fear is that instead of going to sustainable solutions, we might go to reprimarization of the economy. This is my worry that since they want to recover as soon as possible. And, and, and that's where I think we have to think very creatively on how, and we in ECLAC have done, for example, an analysis of sector by sector, which are those sectors that are being most affected by the pandemic. One of them is tourism. So what are the, what are the alternatives we can offer for a better, for a better way of tourism? And, and, and that could be a very interesting option. The Caribbean countries depend 
totally on tourism. Come on. That's the way they are in, in, in Central America. Look at Costa Rica. But Costa Rica has, uh, has found a solution more or less by we can learn how to combine solutions based on nature with tourism, for example. And, and we have to think about it, how to, how to build solutions that are economically feasible for a region that is looking for, for money, for foreign currency, because we are uh, killed by the foreign debt. By, uh, by the exports. So we have to find the, the fine tune these things. And, uh, and, and finally, I would say, we have to put together an investment portfolio. We have to think very profoundly of an investment portfolio that can really make us move towards this environmental push. We are calling it the big push as Rostein and, Ros and Rodan thought about it in 1929. So that's why we are using that term. But we are qualifying with a big environmental or a big sustainability push. The recovery, if we put this dimension of how investments can be better as an energy transition or an agroecology, but we have to find the economic advantage and the creation of employment. These two variables we have to put in, economy and employment. If we don't do that, we are never going to convince the finance ministers and the social and the, and, and the other sectors of the economy. They will still think that this is an environmental problem and it's not an environmental problem. It's going to hit everybody, but we have to show them how to do this. Thanks very much, Alicia. Uh, Gabriel, please. Yes, a comment that is that connected with, with what Patricia and, and, and Alicia uh, said. But, but it's something that, that it's for, for us, the, the environmentalists. And, and, and it's how do we work uh, together in terms of understanding that this, that, that this silos that we have built in, in terms of our communities, the, the, the biodiversity ones in one side and the climate, the climate uh, change, the other, the climate change, or the, 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 those ones that are interested in the certification or, 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 or drug. Uh, on, on the other side, um, we, we, we must work together because the, 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 the reality does, does not uh, make any difference about to which convention are you, are you affiliated with. Uh, the, 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 this, this separation between conventions and this separation between sectors in the, in, in the management of the, of, of the state is, 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 is something that we use for, for the reality not, not to overwhelm us, but, but what we need to keep in touch, uh, to, to keep uh, the clear idea that the reality is integrated and that the, the, the solutions must be uh, designed, uh, taking in account all these, all, these, all these visions and all these uh, efforts that, that, that need to be connected. The NDCs must uh, be uh, able to, to, to talk with the LDN measures that are proposed in uh, and under the, the Convention on the Certification. And, and, and they must uh, talk, be able to talk with whatever comes from, from the discussions of, of the CDB uh, regarding, regarding uh, a, a new strategic approach or a new strategic plan uh, for, for, for the future. And, 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 and that uh, brings us to take it Take, it, take these things to the local realm, because in the local realm, you can see that there is only one problem. The problem is our relationship with nature and, and the certification climate change or biodiversity are, are only uh, different views from the, for the same problem, different point angles of view for the same problem. And, and, and there at the local level, communities and people work together and, 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 and they always, they are always the same sitting discussing the different, the different issues. When you go up, 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 and you go to the national level or well, to the global level, then, then community, the, 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 the practical communities separate themselves. And then we, we have this thing of, we are more important than you because we have more money or we have been able to access the, 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 the mind of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, that, that might be said by, by, by those uh, involved in climate change, but climate change, biodiversity, the certification are the, the different sides of, of sites of the same 
of the same problem, I, I think. And that's, that is a must for, for us environmentalists. How, how do we understand this uh, out of the, the, this, this silo uh, mind? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gabriel. And I'd let that be the final word from the panel. Uh, so I'd like to thank Alicia, Patricia, and Gabriel for their excellent contributions to the panel discussion and uh, Teresa Rivera for her video address. This brings us uh, to the close of this uh, webinar series. And uh, it's also the end of the final dialogue that, uh, that, that we had as part of the Green uh, Recovery Dialogues. So uh, on behalf of the OECD, let me just uh, say a big thank you to our institutional partners in this dialogue. Uh, WWF and EDF uh, for the entire series. And these dialogues have been the product of an excellent collaboration between our organizations, as well as several other partners, uh, depending upon the topic uh, of the particular event. And um, for final remarks uh, from uh, WWF, uh, let me invite uh, let me invite uh, Vanessa Perez, uh, who is the WWF Climate and Energy Global Deputy to uh, give her closing remarks. Uh, Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Shardul. And um, I'll try to be very, very quick. I think we've had a fantastic panel. Um, again, thank you for the, for the great speakers that we had today. As Shardul mentioned, we have had six different uh, dialogues on the covering six different topics. It has been full of content. Uh, you can look at all of the videos and the stories of each of the dialogues in the, in the websites that will be posted in the chat box. Uh, let me add my thanks to OECD Environment Directorate and EDF for a fantastic collaboration. Uh, it is really hard to wrap up the, the, the dialogues with, uh, with, the, with the takeaway. So please go and, and, and look at the stories. But I'll try to give uh, just five, five reflections that I think for me capture most of the, the things that we have discussed. Um, the first one is that we must recognize the foundational role of nature. And that foundational role is uh, reflected both on economic and social issues. And economic and reflecting it in economic decision making is a, a very good way to take this topic forward. Uh, we must build resilience and sustainability considerations throughout. We must create a vision and do backcasting to do short-term decision-making to ensure we bring the recovery. We are not in a good path. If we see the numbers and if we see the stats, we are not having green recovery packages. And that might be meaning that we're not getting to political stakeholders in the right way. And so we must create a joint vision of the future that we want and we must deliver it through the right avenues. Um, the other takeaway that I, that I take is climate and nature are profoundly interlinked. And if we don't address the, both the drivers of climate change and natural loss in a, in a combined way, it's going to be difficult to sort both crises. And nature-based solutions with very clear principles, some of them were reflected by Patricia today, are an, a big opportunity if we actually make companies uh, incorporate those principles throughout supply chains. Um, the fourth reflection I'll make is that blended finance is, has a key role to play. Uh, public finance will not be enough, but also if we don't ensure good criteria and standards to direct private finance to the right places to ensure public benefits. It's going to be a difficult uh, endeavor, endeavor. And the fifth uh, uh, takeaway that I, that I get is that we must use the good institutional and institutional structures that we already have. There's a lot of local knowledge and social capital uh, throughout different regions. And today it was very clear that Latin America has community-based enterprises, community-based knowledge, but all, not only institutions at the local level, but there are very, very valuable institutions at the national level, such as 
the institutions that have been crafted to create nationally determined contributions and other type of um, um, economic and, and, uh, and climate planning that could also be used to ensure uh, green recovery. And of course, at the international level, there are very important institutions that are leading the way and countries, we must, must take that, that international um, call that we're seeing for a green recovery, we must take it to the national level. So thank you so much, Shardul. Thank you so much to the panelists. This has been a fantastic set of uh, webinars and we are, we, will, we are very, very happy to be able to host this together with our partners. So thank you everyone and we're, um, we're, uh, oh, we're, we're welcome to, to leave and uh, you can find all the information about the dialogues there. Shardul, the speakers, uh, Patricia, Gabriel, Alicia, thank you so much for this dialogue. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Muy bien, Mane. <laughs> Thank you.